英語聞き流しリスニング、英語テキストと MP3 音声ダウンロードはホームページからご利用いただけます。88thpp.com、88thpp.com。Chapter 20 Freed from prison, Pinocchio sets out to return to the ferry, but on the way he meets a serpent and later is caught in a trap. Fancy the happiness of Pinocchio on finding himself free. Without saying yes or no, he fled from the city and set out on the road that was to take him back to the house of the lovely fairy. It had rained for many days, and the road was so muddy that, at times, Pinocchio sank down almost to his knees. But he kept on bravely. Tormented by the wish to see his father and his fairy sister with azure hair, he raced like a greyhound. As he ran, he was splashed with mud even up to his cap. How unhappy I have been! He said to himself, And yet I deserve everything, for I am certainly very stubborn and stupid. I will always have my own way. I won't listen to those who love me and who have more brains than I, but from now on, I'll be different and I'll try to become a most obedient boy. I have found out, beyond any doubt whatever, that disobedient boys are certainly far from happy, and that, in the long run, they always lose out. I wonder if father is waiting for me. Will I find him at the fairy's house? It is so long, poor man. Since I have seen him, and I do so on his love and his kisses. And will the fairy ever forgive me for all I have done? She who has been so good to me and to whom I owe my life. Can there be a worse or more heartless boy than I am anywhere? As he spoke, he stopped suddenly, frozen with terror. What was the matter? An immense serpent lay stretched across the road, a serpent with a bright green skin, fiery eyes which glowed and burned, and a pointed tail that smoked like a chimney. How frightened was poor Pinocchio! He ran back wildly for half a mile, and at last settled himself atop a heap of stones to wait for the serpent to go on his way and leave the road clear for him. He waited an hour, two hours, three hours, but the serpent was always there, and even from afar one could see the flash of his red eyes and the column of smoke which rose from his long, pointed tail. Pinocchio, trying to feel very brave, walked straight up to him and said in a sweet, soothing voice, I beg your pardon, Mr. Serpent. Would you be so kind as to step aside to let me pass? He might as well have talked to a wall. The serpent never moved. Once more, in the same sweet voice, he spoke. You must know, Mr. Serpent, that I am going home where my father is waiting for me. It is so long since I have seen him. Would you mind very much if I passed? He waited for some sign of an answer to his questions, but the answer did not come. On the contrary, the green serpent, who had seemed, until then, wide awake and full of life, Became suddenly very quiet and still. His eyes closed and his tail stopped smoking. Is he dead, I wonder? said Pinocchio, rubbing his hands together happily. Without a moment's hesitation, he started to step over him, but he had just raised one leg when the serpent shot up like a spring and the marionette fell head over heels backward. He fell so awkwardly that his head stuck in the mud, and there he stood with his legs straight up in the air. At the sight of the marionette kicking and squirming like a young whirlwind, The serpent laughed so heartily and so long that at last he burst an artery and died on the spot. Pinocchio freed himself from his awkward position and once more began to run in order to reach the fairy's house before dark. As he went, the pangs of hunger grew so strong that, unable to withstand them, he jumped into a field to pick a few grapes that tempted him. Woe to him! No sooner had he reached the grapevine than, crack! When his legs. The poor marionette was caught in a trap set there by a farmer for some weasels which came every night to steal his chickens. Chapter 21 Pinocchio is caught by a farmer, who uses him as a watchdog for his chicken coop. Pinocchio, as you may well imagine, began to scream and weep and beg, but all was of no use, for no houses were to be seen and not a soul passed by on the road. Night came on. A little because of the sharp pain in his legs, a little because of fright at finding himself alone in the darkness of the field, the marionette was about to faint, when he saw a tiny glowworm flickering by. He called to her and said, Dear little glowworm, will you set me free? Poor little fellow! replied the glowworm, stopping to look at him with pity. How came you to be caught in this trap? I stepped into this lonely field to take a few grapes and. Are the grapes yours? No. Who has taught you to take things that do not belong to you? I was hungry. Hunger, my boy, is no reason for taking something which belongs to another. It's true, it's true! cried Pinocchio in tears. I won't do it again. Just then, the conversation was interrupted by approaching footsteps. It was the owner of the field, who was coming on tiptoes to see if, by chance, he had caught the weasels which had been eating his chickens. Great was his surprise when, 
On holding up his lantern, he saw that, instead of a weasel, he had caught a boy. Ah, you little thief! said the farmer in an angry voice. So you are the one who steals my chickens. Not I. No, no. cried Pinocchio, sobbing bitterly. I came here only to take a very few grapes. He who steals grapes may very easily steal chickens also. Take my word for it, I'll give you a lesson that you'll remember for a long while. He opened the trap, grabbed the marionette by the collar, and carried him to the house as if he were a puppy. When he reached the yard in front of the house, he flung him to the ground, put a foot on his neck, and said to him roughly, It is late now and it's time for bed. Tomorrow we'll settle matters. In the meantime, since my watchdog died today, you may take his place and guard my henhouse. No sooner said than done. He slipped a dog collar around Pinocchio's neck and tightened it so that it would not come off. A long iron chain was tied to the collar. The other end of the chain was nailed to the wall. If tonight it should happen to rain, said the farmer, you can sleep in that little doghouse nearby, where you will find plenty of straw for a soft bed. It has been Malampo's bed for three years, and it will be good enough for you. And if, by any chance, any thieves should come, be sure to bark. After this last warning, the farmer went into the house and closed the door and barred it. Poor Pinocchio huddled close to the doghouse more dead than alive from cold, hunger, and fright. Now and again he pulled and tugged at the collar which nearly choked him and cried out in a weak voice. I deserve it. Yes, I deserve it. I have been nothing but a truant and a vagabond. I have never obeyed anyone and I have always done as I pleased. If I were only like so many others and had studied and worked and stayed with my poor old father, I should not find myself here now, in this field and in the darkness, taking the place of a farmer's watchdog. Oh, if I could start all over again. But what is done can't be undone, and I must be patient. After this little sermon to himself, which came from the very depths of his heart, Pinocchio went into the doghouse and fell asleep. Chapter 22 Pinocchio discovers the thieves and, as a reward for faithfulness, he regains his liberty. Even though a boy may be very unhappy, he very seldom loses sleep over his worries. The marionette, being no exception to this rule, slept on peacefully for a few hours till well along toward midnight, when he was awakened by strange whisperings and stealthy sounds coming from the yard. He stuck his nose out of the doghouse and saw four slender, hairy animals. They were weasels, small animals very fond of both eggs and chickens. One of them left her companions and, going to the door of the doghouse, said in a sweet voice, Good evening, Malampo. My name is not Malampo, answered Pinocchio. Who are you, then? I am Pinocchio. What are you doing here? I'm the watchdog. But where is Malampo? Where is the old dog who used to live in this house? He died this morning. Died? Poor beast. He was so good. Still, judging by your face, I think you, too, are a good-natured dog. I beg your pardon, I am not a dog. What are you, then? I am a marionette. Are you taking the place of the watchdog? I'm sorry to say that I am. I'm being punished. Well, I shall make the same terms with you that we had with the dead Malampo. I am sure you will be glad to hear them. And what are the terms? This is our plan, we'll come once in a while, as in the past, to pay a visit to this henhouse, and we'll take away eight chickens. Of these, seven are for us, and one for you, provided, of course, that you will make believe you are sleeping and will not bark for the farmer. Did Malampo really do that? asked Pinocchio. Indeed he did, and because of that we were the best of friends. Sleep away peacefully, and remember that before we go we shall leave you a nice fat chicken all ready for your breakfast in the morning. Is that understood? Even too well, answered Pinocchio. And shaking his head in a threatening manner, he seemed to say, We'll talk this over in a few minutes, my friends. As soon as the four weasels had talked things over, they went straight to the chicken coop which stood close to the doghouse. Digging busily with teeth and claws, they opened the little door and slipped in but they were no sooner in than they heard the door close with a sharp bang. The one who had done the trick was Pinocchio, who, not satisfied with that, dragged a heavy stone in front of it. That done, he started to bark. And he barked as if he were a real watchdog, Bo, wow, wow. Bo, wow. The farmer heard the loud barks and jumped out of bed. Taking his gun, he leapt to the window and shouted, What's the matter? The thieves are here, answered Pinocchio. Where are they? in the chicken coop. I'll come down in a second. And, in fact, he was down in the yard in a twinkling and running toward the chicken coop. He opened the door, pulled out the weasels one by one, and, after tying them in a bag, 
said to them in a happy voice, you're in my hands at last. I could punish you now, but I'll wait. In the morning you may come with me to the inn and there you'll make a fine dinner for some hungry mortal. It is really too great an honor for you, one you do not deserve, but, as you see, I am really a very kind and generous man and I am going to do this for you. Then he went up to Pinocchio and began to pet and caress him. How did you ever find them out so quickly? And to think that Malampo, my faithful Malampo, never saw them in all these years. The marionette could have told, then and there, all he knew about the shameful contract between the dog and the weasels, but thinking of the dead dog, he said to himself, Malampo is dead. What is the use of accusing him? The dead are gone and they cannot defend themselves. The best thing to do is to leave them in peace. Were you awake or asleep when they came? Continued the farmer. I was asleep, answered Pinocchio, but they awakened me with their whisperings. One of them even came to the door of the dog house and said to me, If you promise not to bark, we will make you a present of one of the chickens for your breakfast. Did you hear that? They had the audacity to make such a proposition as that to me. For you must know that, though I am a very wicked marionette full of faults, still I never have been, nor ever shall be, bribed. Fine boy! cried the farmer, slapping him on the shoulder in a friendly way. You ought to be proud of yourself. And to show you what I think of you, you are free from this instant. And he slipped the dog collar from his neck. Chapter 23 Pinocchio weeps upon learning that the lovely maiden with azure hair is dead. He meets a pigeon, who carries him to the seashore. He throws himself into the sea to go to the aid of his father. As soon as Pinocchio no longer felt the shameful weight of the dog collar around his neck, he started to run across the fields and meadows, and never stopped till he came to the main road that was to take him to the fairy's house. When he reached it, he looked into the valley far below him and there he saw the wood where unluckily he had met the fox and the cat, and the tall oak tree where he had been hanged, but though he searched far and near, he could not see the house where the fairy with the azure hair lived. He became terribly frightened and, running as fast as he could, he finally came to the spot where it had once stood. The little house was no longer there. In its place lay a small marble slab, which bore this sad inscription. Here lies the lovely fairy with azure hair WHO died of grief when abandoned by her little brother Pinocchio. The poor marionette was heartbroken at reading these words. He fell to the ground and, covering the cold marble with kisses, burst into bitter tears. He cried all night, and dawn found him still there, though his tears had dried and only hard, dry sobs shook his wooden frame. But these were so loud that they could be heard by the faraway hills. As he sobbed he said to himself, Oh, my fairy, my dear, dear fairy, why did you die? Why did I not die, who am so bad, instead of you, who are so good? And my father, where can he be? Please dear fairy, tell me where he is and I shall never, never leave him again. You are not really dead, are you? If you love me, you will come back, alive as before. Don't you feel sorry for me? I'm so lonely. If the two assassins come, they'll hang me again from the giant oak tree and I will really die, this time. What shall I do alone in the world? Now that you are dead and my father is lost, where shall I eat? Where shall I sleep? Who will make my new clothes? Oh, I want to die. Yes, I want to die. Oh, oh. Poor Pinocchio. He even tried to tear his hair, but as it was only painted on his wooden head, he could not even pull it. Just then a large pigeon flew far above him. Seeing the marionette, he cried to him. Tell me, little boy, what are you doing there? Can't you see? I'm crying, cried Pinocchio, lifting his head toward the voice and rubbing his eyes with his sleeve. Tell me, asked the pigeon, do you by chance know of a marionette, Pinocchio by name? Pinocchio. Did you say Pinocchio? replied the marionette, jumping to his feet. Why, I am Pinocchio. At this answer, the pigeon flew swiftly down to the earth. He was much larger than a turkey. Then you know Geppetto also? Do I know him? He's my father, my poor, dear father. Has he, perhaps, spoken to you of me? Will you take me to him? Is he still alive? Answer me, please. Is he still alive? I left him three days ago on the shore of a large sea. What was he doing? He was building a little boat with which to cross the ocean. For the last four months, that poor man has been wandering around Europe, looking for you. Not having found you yet, he has made up his mind to look for you in the new world, far across the ocean. How far is it from here to the shore? asked Pinocchio anxiously. More than fifty miles. Fifty miles? Oh, dear pigeon, how I wish I had your wings. If you want to come, I'll take you with me. How? Astride my back. Are you very heavy? Heavy? 
Not at all. I'm only a feather. Very well. Saying nothing more, Pinocchio jumped on the pigeon's back and, as he settled himself, he cried out gaily. Gallop on, gallop on, my pretty steed. I'm in a great hurry. The pigeon flew away, and in a few minutes he had reached the clouds. The marionette looked to see what was below them. His head swam and he was so frightened that he clutched wildly at the pigeon's neck to keep himself from falling. They flew all day. Toward evening the pigeon said. I'm very thirsty. And I'm very hungry. Said Pinocchio. Let us stop a few minutes at that pigeon coop down there. Then we can go on and be at the seashore in the morning. They went into the empty coop and there they found nothing but a bowl of water and a small basket filled with chickpeas. The marionette had always hated chickpeas. According to him, they had always made him sick, but that night he ate them with a relish. As he finished them, he turned to the pigeon and said. I never should have thought that chickpeas could be so good. You must remember, my boy, answered the pigeon, that hunger is the best sauce. After resting a few minutes longer, they set out again. The next morning they were at the seashore. Pinocchio jumped off the pigeon's back, and the pigeon, not wanting any thanks for a kind deed, flew away swiftly and disappeared. The shore was full of people, shrieking and tearing their hair as they looked toward the sea. What has happened? asked Pinocchio of a little old woman. A poor old father lost his only son some time ago and today he built a tiny boat for himself in order to go in search of him across the ocean. The water is very rough and we're afraid he will be drowned. Where is the little boat? There. Straight down there, answered the little old woman, pointing to a tiny shadow, no bigger than a nutshell, floating on the sea. Pinocchio looked closely for a few minutes and then gave a sharp cry. It's my father. It's my father. Meanwhile, the little boat, tossed about by the angry waters, appeared and disappeared in the waves. And Pinocchio, standing on a high rock, tired out with searching, waved to him with hand and cap and even with his nose. It looked as if Geppetto, though far away from the shore, recognized his son, for he took off his cap and waved also. He seemed to be trying to make everyone understand that he would come back if he were able, but the sea was so heavy that he could do nothing with his oars. Suddenly a huge wave came and the boat disappeared. They waited and waited for it, but it was gone. Poor man! said the fisher folk on the shore, whispering a prayer as they turned to go home. Just then a desperate cry was heard. Turning around, the fisher folk saw Pinocchio dive into the sea and heard him cry out. I'll save him! I'll save my father! The marionette, being made of wood, floated easily along and swam like a fish in the rough water. Now and again he disappeared only to reappear once more. In a twinkling, he was far away from land. At last he was completely lost to view. Poor boy! cried the fisher folk on the shore, and again they mumbled a few prayers, as they returned home. Chapter 24 Pinocchio reaches the island of the busy bees and finds the fairy once more. Pinocchio, spurred on by the hope of finding his father and of being in time to save him, swam all night long. And what a horrible night it was! It poured rain, it hailed, it thundered, and the lightning was so bright that it turned the night into day. At dawn, he saw, not far away from him, a long stretch of sand. It was an island in the middle of the sea. Pinocchio tried his best to get there, but he couldn't. The waves played with him and tossed him about as if he were a twig or a bit of straw. At last, and luckily for him, a tremendous wave tossed him to the very spot where he wanted to be. The blow from the wave was so strong that, as he fell to the ground, his joints cracked and almost broke. But, nothing daunted, he jumped to his feet and cried. Once more I have escaped with my life. Little by little the sky cleared. The sun came out in full splendor and the sea became as calm as a lake. Then the marionette took off his clothes and laid them on the sand to dry. He looked over the waters to see whether he might catch sight of a boat with a little man in it. He searched and he searched, but he saw nothing except sea and sky and far away a few sails, so small that they might have been birds. If only I knew the name of this island. He said to himself. If I even knew what kind of people I would find here. But whom shall I ask? There is no one here. The idea of finding himself in so lonesome a spot made him so sad that he was about to cry, but just then he saw a big fish swimming nearby, with his head far out of the water. Not knowing what to call him, the marionette said to him. Hey there, Mr. Fish, may I have a word with you? Even too, if you want, answered the fish, who happened to be a very polite dolphin. Will you please tell me if, on this island, there are places where one may eat without necessarily being eaten? Surely, there are, answered the dolphin. 
in fact you'll find one not far from this spot. And how shall I get there? Take that path on your left and follow your nose. You can't go wrong. Tell me another thing. You who travel day and night through the sea, did you not perhaps meet a little boat with my father in it? And who is your father? He is the best father in the world, even as I am the worst son that can be found. In the storm of last night, answered the dolphin, the little boat must have been swamped. And my father? By this time, he must have been swallowed by the terrible shark, which, for the last few days, has been bringing terror to these waters. Is this shark very big? asked Pinocchio, who was beginning to tremble with fright. Is he big? replied the dolphin. Just to give you an idea of his size, let me tell you that he is larger than a five-story building, and that he has a mouth so big and so deep, that a whole train and engine could easily get into it. Mother mine! cried the marionette, scared to death, and dressing himself as fast as he could, he turned to the dolphin and said, Farewell, Mr. Fish. Pardon the bother, and many thanks for your kindness. This said, he took the path at so swift a gait that he seemed to fly, and at every small sound he heard, he turned in fear to see whether the terrible shark, five stories high and with a train in his mouth, was following him. After walking a half hour, he came to a small country called the Land of the Busy Bees. The streets were filled with people running to and fro about their tasks. Everyone worked, everyone had something to do. Even if one were to search with a lantern, not one idle man or one tramp could have been found. I understand, said Pinocchio at once wearily, this is no place for me. I was not born for work. But in the meantime, he began to feel hungry, for it was twenty-four hours since he had eaten. What was to be done? There were only two means left to him in order to get a bite to eat. He had either to work or to beg. He was ashamed to beg, because his father had always preached to him that begging should be done only by the sick or the old. He had said that the real poor in this world, deserving of our pity and help, were only those who, either through age or sickness, had lost the means of earning their bread with their own hands. All others should work, and if they didn't, and went hungry, so much the worse for them. Just then a man passed by, worn out and wet with perspiration, pulling, with difficulty, two heavy carts filled with coal. Pinocchio looked at him and, judging him by his looks to be a kind man, said to him with eyes downcast in shame. Will you be so good as to give me a penny, for I am faint with hunger? Not only one penny, answered the coal man. I'll give you four if you will help me pull these two wagons. I am surprised, answered the marionette, very much offended. I wish you to know that I never have been a donkey, nor have I ever pulled a wagon. So much the better for you, answered the coal man. Then, my boy, if you are really faint with hunger, eat two slices of your pride, and I hope they don't give you indigestion. A few minutes after, a bricklayer passed by, carrying a pail full of plaster on his shoulder. Good man, will you be kind enough to give a penny to a poor boy who is yawning from hunger? Gladly, answered the bricklayer. Come with me and carry some plaster, and instead of one penny, I'll give you five. But the plaster is heavy, answered Pinocchio, and the work too hard for me. If the work is too hard for you, my boy, enjoy your yawns and may they bring you luck. In less than a half hour, at least twenty people passed and Pinocchio begged of each one, but they all answered. Aren't you ashamed? Instead of being a beggar in the streets, why don't you look for work and earn your own bread? Finally a little woman went by carrying two water jugs. Good woman, will you allow me to have a drink from one of your jugs? Asked Pinocchio, who was burning up with thirst. With pleasure, my boy. She answered setting the two jugs on the ground before him. When Pinocchio had had his fill, he grumbled, as he wiped his mouth. My thirst is gone. If I could only as easily get rid of my hunger. On hearing these words, the good little woman immediately said. If you help me to carry these jugs home, I'll give you a slice of bread. Pinocchio looked at the jug and said neither yes nor no. And with the bread, I'll give you a nice dish of cauliflower with white sauce on it. Pinocchio gave the jug another look and said neither yes nor no and after the cauliflower, some cake and jam. At this last bribery, Pinocchio could no longer resist and said firmly. Very well. I'll take the jug home for you. The jug was very heavy, and the marionette, not being strong enough to carry it with his hands, had to put it on his head. When they arrived home, the little woman made Pinocchio sit down at a small table and placed before him the bread, the cauliflower, and the cake. Pinocchio did not eat, he devoured. His stomach seemed a bottomless pit. His hunger finally appeased, he raised his head to thank his kind benefactress. But he had not looked at her long when he gave a cry of surprise and sat there with his eyes wide open, his fork in the air, 
and his mouth filled with bread and cauliflower. Why all this surprise? asked the good woman, laughing. Because, answered Pinocchio, stammering and stuttering, because, you look like, you remind me of, yes, yes, the same voice, the same eyes, the same hair, yes, 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 you also have the same azure hair she had, oh, my little fairy, my little fairy. Tell me that it is you. Don't make me cry any longer. If you only knew. I have cried so much, I have suffered so. And Pinocchio threw himself on the floor and clasped the knees of the mysterious little woman. Chapter 25 Pinocchio promises the fairy to be good and to study, as he is growing tired of being a marionette, and wishes to become a real boy. If Pinocchio cried much longer, the little woman thought he would melt away, so she finally admitted that she was the little fairy with azure hair. You rascal of a marionette! How did you know it was I? She asked, laughing. My love for you told me who you were. Do you remember? You left me when I was a little girl and now you find me a grown woman. I am so old, I could almost be your mother. I am very glad of that, for then I can call you mother instead of sister. For a long time I have wanted a mother, just like other boys. But how did you grow so quickly? That's a secret. Tell it to me. I also want to grow a little. Look at me. I have never grown higher than a penny's worth of cheese. But you can't grow, answered the fairy. Why not? Because marionettes never grow. They are born marionettes, they live marionettes, and they die marionettes. Oh, I'm tired of always being a marionette, cried Pinocchio disgustedly. It's about time for me to grow into a man as everyone else does. And you will if you deserve it. Really? What can I do to deserve it? It's a very simple matter. Try to act like a well-behaved child. Don't you think I do? Far from it. Good boys are obedient, and you, on the contrary. And I never obey. Good boys love study and work, but you. And I, on the contrary, am a lazy fellow and a tramp all year round. Good boys always tell the truth. And I always tell lies. Good boys go gladly to school. And I get sick if I go to school. From now on I'll be different. Do you promise? I promise. I want to become a good boy and be a comfort to my father. Where is my poor father now? I do not know. Will I ever be lucky enough to find him and embrace him once more? I think so. Indeed, I am sure of it. At this answer, Pinocchio's happiness was very great. He grasped the fairy's hands and kissed them so hard that it looked as if he had lost his head. Then lifting his face, he looked at her lovingly and asked, Tell me, little mother, it isn't true that you are dead, is it? It doesn't seem so, answered the fairy, smiling. If you only knew how I suffered and how I wept when I read here lies. I know it, and for that I have forgiven you. The depth of your sorrow made me see that you have a kind heart. There is always hope for boys with hearts such as yours, though they may often be very mischievous. This is the reason why I have come so far to look for you. From now on, I'll be your own little mother. Oh! How lovely! cried Pinocchio, jumping with joy. You will obey me always and do as I wish. Gladly, very gladly, more than gladly. Beginning tomorrow, said the fairy, you'll go to school every day. Pinocchio's face fell a little. Then you will choose the trade you like best. Pinocchio became more serious. What are you mumbling to yourself? asked the fairy. I was just saying, whined the marionette in a whisper, that it seems too late for me to go to school now. No, indeed. Remember it is never too late to learn. But I don't want either trade or profession. Why? Because work wearies me. My dear boy, said the fairy, people who speak as you do usually end their days either in a prison or in a hospital. A man, remember, whether rich or poor, should do something in this world. No one can find happiness without work. Woe betide the lazy fellow. Laziness is a serious illness and one must cure it immediately, yes, even from early childhood. If not, it will kill you in the end. These words touched Pinocchio's heart. He lifted his eyes to his fairy and said seriously, I'll work. I'll study, I'll do all you tell me. After all, the life of a marionette has grown very tiresome to me and I want to become a boy, no matter how hard it is. You promise that, do you not? Yes, I promise, and now it is up to you. Chapter 26 Pinocchio goes to the seashore with his friends to see the terrible shark. In the morning, bright and early, Pinocchio started for school. Imagine what the boys said when they saw a marionette enter the classroom. They laughed until they cried. Everyone played tricks on him. 
one pulled his hat off, another tugged at his coat, a third tried to paint a mustache under his nose. One even attempted to tie strings to his feet and his hands to make him dance. For a while Pinocchio was very calm and quiet. Finally, however, he lost all patience and turning to his tormentors, he said to them threateningly. Careful, boys, I haven't come here to be made fun of. I'll respect you and I want you to respect me. Hurrah for Dr. Noel. You have spoken like a printed book. How the boys, bursting with laughter. One of them, more impudent than the rest, put out his hand to pull the marionette's nose. But he was not quick enough, for Pinocchio stretched his leg under the table and kicked him hard on the shin. Oh, what hard feet! cried the boy, rubbing the spot where the marionette had kicked him. And what elbows! They are even harder than the feet! shouted another one, who, because of some other trick, had received a blow in the stomach. With that kick and that blow, Pinocchio gained everybody's favor. Everyone admired him, danced attendance upon him, petted and caressed him. As the days passed into weeks, even the teacher praised him, for he saw him attentive, hard working, and wide awake, always the first to come in the morning, and the last to leave when school was over. Pinocchio's only fault was that he had too many friends. Among these were many well known rascals, who cared not a jot for study or for success. The teacher warned him each day, and even the good fairy repeated to him many times. Take care, Pinocchio. Those bad companions will sooner or later make you lose your love for study. Some day they will lead you astray. There's no such danger, answered the marionette, shrugging his shoulders and pointing to his forehead as if to say, I'm too wise. So it happened that one day, as he was walking to school, he met some boys who ran up to him and said, Have you heard the news? No. A shark as big as a mountain has been seen near the shore. Really? I wonder if it could be the same one I heard of when my father was drowned? We are going to see it. Are you coming? No, not I. I must go to school. What do you care about school? You can go there tomorrow. With a lesson more or less, we are always the same donkeys. And what will the teacher say? Let him talk. He is paid to grumble all day long. And my mother? Mothers don't know anything, answered those scamps. Do you know what I'll do? said Pinocchio. For certain reasons of mine, I, too, want to see that shark, but I'll go after school. I can see him then as well as now. Poor simpleton! cried one of the boys. Do you think that a fish of that size will stand there waiting for you? He turns and off he goes, and no one will ever be the wiser. How long does it take from here to the shore? asked the marionette. One hour there and back. Very well, then. Let's see who gets there first. cried Pinocchio. At the signal, the little troop, with books under their arms, dashed across the fields. Pinocchio led the way, running as if on wings, the others following as fast as they could. Now and again, he looked back and, seeing his followers hot and tired, and with tongues hanging out, he laughed out heartily. Unhappy boy! If he had only known then the dreadful things that were to happen to him on account of his disobedience. Chapter 27 The Great Battle Between Pinocchio and His Playmates One is Wounded Pinocchio is arrested. Going like the wind, Pinocchio took but a very short time to reach the shore. He glanced all about him, but there was no sign of a shark. The sea was as smooth as glass. Hey there, boys! Where's that shark? He asked, turning to his playmates. He may have gone for his breakfast, said one of them, laughing. Or, perhaps, he went to bed for a little nap, said another, laughing also. From the answers and the laughter which followed them, Pinocchio understood that the boys had played a trick on him. What now? He said angrily to them. What's the joke? Oh, the joke's on you! cried his tormentors, laughing more heartily than ever, and dancing gaily around the marionette. And that is? That we have made you stay out of school to come with us. Aren't you ashamed of being such a goody-goody, and of studying so hard? You never have a bit of enjoyment. And what is it to you, if I do study? What does the teacher think of us, you mean? Why? Don't you see? If you study and we don't, we pay for it. After all, it's only fair to look out for ourselves. What do you want me to do? Hate school and books and teachers, as we all do. They are your worst enemies, you know, and they like to make you as unhappy as they can. And if I go on studying, what will you do to me? You'll pay for it. Really, you amuse me, answered the marionette, nodding his head. Hey, Pinocchio, cried the tallest of them all, that will do. We are tired of hearing you bragging about yourself, you little turkey cock. You may not be afraid of us, but remember we are not afraid of you, either. 
you are alone, you know, and we are seven. Like the seven sins, said Pinocchio, still laughing. Did you hear that? He has insulted us all. He has called us sins. Pinocchio, apologize for that, or look out. Cuck, ooh, said the marionette, mocking them with his thumb to his nose. You'll be sorry. Cuck, ooh. We'll whip you soundly. Cuck, ooh. You'll go home with a broken nose. Cuck, ooh. Very well, then. Take that, and keep it for your supper, called out the boldest of his tormentors. And with the words, he gave Pinocchio a terrible blow on the head. Pinocchio answered with another blow, and that was the signal for the beginning of the fray. In a few moments, the fight raged hot and heavy on both sides. Pinocchio, although alone, defended himself bravely. With those two wooden feet of his, he worked so fast that his opponents kept at a respectful distance. Wherever they landed, they left their painful mark and the boys could only run away and howl. Enraged at not being able to fight the marionette at close quarters, they started to throw all kinds of books at him. Readers, geographies, histories, grammars flew in all directions. But Pinocchio was keen of eye and swift of movement, and the books only passed over his head, landed in the sea, and disappeared. The fish, thinking they might be good to eat, came to the top of the water in great numbers. Some took a nibble, some took a bite, but no sooner had they tasted a page or two, than they spat them out with a wry face, as if to say, What a horrid taste! Our own food is so much better. Meanwhile, the battle waxed more and more furious. At the noise, a large crab crawled slowly out of the water and, with a voice that sounded like a trombone suffering from a cold, he cried out. Stop fighting, you rascals! These battles between boys rarely end well. Trouble is sure to come to you. Poor crab! He might as well have spoken to the wind. Instead of listening to his good advice, Pinocchio turned to him and said as roughly as he knew how. Keep quiet, ugly gab. It would be better for you to chew a few cough drops to get rid of that cold you have. Go to bed and sleep. You will feel better in the morning. In the meantime, the boys, having used all their books, looked around for new ammunition. Seeing Pinocchio's bundle lying idle nearby, they somehow managed to get hold of it. One of the books was a very large volume, an arithmetic text, heavily bound in leather. It was Pinocchio's pride. Among all his books, he liked that one the best. Thinking it would make a fine missile, one of the boys took hold of it and threw it with all his strength at Pinocchio's head. But instead of hitting the marionette, the book struck one of the other boys, who, as pale as a ghost, cried out faintly, Oh, other help! I'm dying! And fell senseless to the ground. At the sight of that pale little corpse, the boys were so frightened that they turned tail and ran. In a few moments, all had disappeared. All except Pinocchio. Although scared to death by the horror of what had been done, he ran to the sea and soaked his handkerchief in the cool water and with it bathed the head of his poor little schoolmate. Sobbing bitterly, he called to him, saying, Eugene. My poor Eugene. Open your eyes and look at me. Why don't you answer? I was not the one who hit you, you know. Believe me, I didn't do it. Open your eyes, Eugene. If you keep them shut, I'll die, too. Oh, dear me, how shall I ever go home now? How shall I ever look at my little mother again? What will happen to me? Where shall I go? Where shall I hide? Oh, how much better it would have been, a thousand times better, if only I had gone to school. Why did I listen to those boys? They always were a bad influence. And to think that the teacher had told me, and my mother, too. Beware of bad company. That's what she said. But I'm stubborn and proud. I listen, but always I do as I wish. And then I pay. I've never had a moment's peace since I've been born. Oh, dear. What will become of me? What will become of me? Pinocchio went on crying and moaning and beating his head. Again and again he called to his little friend, when suddenly he heard heavy steps approaching. He looked up and saw two tall carabineers near him. What are you doing stretched out on the ground? They asked Pinocchio. I'm helping this schoolfellow of mine. Has he fainted? I should say so, said one of the carabineers, bending to look at Eugene. This boy has been wounded on the temple. Who has heard him? Not I, stammered the marionette, who had hardly a breath left in his whole body. If it wasn't you, who was it, then? Not I, repeated Pinocchio. And with what was he wounded? With this book, and the marionette picked up the arithmetic text to show it to the officer. And whose book is this? Mine. Enough. Not another word. Get up as quickly as you can come along with us. But I. Come with us. 
but I am innocent. Come with us. Before starting out, the officers called out to several fishermen passing by in a boat and said to them. Take care of this little fellow who has been hurt. Take him home and bind his wounds. Tomorrow we'll come after him. They then took hold of Pinocchio and, putting him between them, said to him in a rough voice, March! And go quickly, or it will be the worse for you. They did not have to repeat their words. The marionette walked swiftly along the road to the village. But the poor fellow hardly knew what he was about. He thought he had a nightmare. He felt ill. His eyes saw everything double, his legs trembled, his tongue was dry, and, try as he might, he could not utter a single word. Yet, in spite of this numbness of feeling, he suffered keenly at the thought of passing under the windows of his good little fairy's house. What would she say on seeing him between two carabineers? They had just reached the village, when a sudden gust of wind blew off Pinocchio's cap and made it go sailing far down the street. Would you allow me, the marionette asked the carabineers, to run after my cap? Very well, go, but hurry. The marionette went, picked up his cap, but instead of putting it on his head, he stuck it between his teeth and then raced toward the sea. He went like a bullet out of a gun. The carabineers, judging that it would be very difficult to catch him, sent a large mastiff after him, one that had won first prize in all the dog races. Pinocchio ran fast and the dog ran faster. At so much noise, the people hung out of the windows or gathered in the street, anxious to see the end of the contest. But they were disappointed, for the dog and Pinocchio raised so much dust on the road that, after a few moments, it was impossible to see them. ものがたりの続きはホームページからお聞きいただけます。またテキストMP3ダウンロードも合わせてご利用ください。88thpp.com88thpp.com